Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us at the Medill Centennial IMC Live event. I am Lilla Bluebell from Gainesville, Georgia, and I'm graduating in December with a master's in marketing communications. Thank you. <laughs> and concentrations in strategic communications and brand strategy. We have both live and virtual audiences this year. For our virtual guests, please remain on mute at all times. If you have questions, please submit those in the Q&A session. Before we begin our program, we'd like to remind everyone that the Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa, as well as the Menominee, Ho-Chunk, and Miami tribes. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and the state of Illinois is still home to over 100,000 tribal members. And now, let me introduce my fellow student and friend, Tim Granado, to begin our program. Enjoy. All righty, thank you, Lila. Um, hi, everyone. To start off tonight, we're going to have a brief introduction from the current Dean of the Medill School, Charles Whitaker. A little background on Charles. Uh, he joined the Medill faculty back in 1992 and has taught a variety of journalism courses uh, over his 29 years with the program. Prior to Medill, Charles was a senior editor at Ebony Magazine, where he covered a wide range of cultural, social, and political issues and events. He currently serves on the board of directors for numerous professional organizations, including the American Society of Magazine Editors and the Center for Public Integrity. He also serves on the advisory boards for the Prison Journalism Project, the Evanston Roundtable, and Black Club Chicago. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight, Dean Whitaker. Thank you, and let me add my welcome. And I also, um, I'm gonna lead off with some questions on this, on this event, and hopefully this will trigger some questions from you. All right, Bradley, I know in your current work at Bully, at, at Bully Pulpit, uh, you advise CEOs on their reputation as, um, or, and other leaders on matters of reputation, I should say. So, um, <laughs> Clearly, one of the experiences that has given you the qualifications to do this was when you were chief spokesman for Boeing during one of the most atrocious crises uh, we all know about. And um, since this is an event that is all about building and rebuilding trust, I am going to start off by asking you what went wrong at Boeing? And thank you, Stacy, for diffusing the tension there a little bit. <laughs> uh, so first of all, Nancy, for, thank you for the invitation. Really appreciate being here. Thanks, Charles, for the incredible introduction. And please keep telling people I'm young. If you want to do that for years to come, we're good with that. Um, let's jump right into it then. I want to start off by maybe laying the groundwork a bit. Uh, for those who are familiar with the crisis that Nancy is talking about, uh, Boeing had two plane accidents, uh, one in 2018, in October of 2018, uh, in Indonesia, which killed 189 people. Uh, six months later, a plane went down in Ethiopia on a flight outside of Addis Ababa that killed another 157 people. Um, the response has been criticized uh, for not necessarily going far enough. When you think about uh, the responsibility that's placed on leaders to talk about the uh, accountability that they've got in a situation like this, the loss of life, uh, the families who were impacted and loved ones who were lost who they'd never see again. Um, the choices that Boeing made at that time coming out of the crisis largely reflected um, a response that was attached to liability. How do you 
describe the products that you've created and the process that you've taken that's working worked for a hundred years at the time the Boeing's a hundred year old company uh, in a way that gives people faith that the company is going to be able to resolve any issues that it has and that if you step on a plane that's created by Boeing that you're going to be able to make it to your destination safely while at the same time giving people confidence that you're a human at the helm and that you are able to see a mistake was made. It impacted people's lives, in this case, fatally, um, and that you were going to do everything within your power to make sure that something like that could never happen again. Um, the initial response from Boeing was probably not quite enough to give people confidence on the second part. So, Unfortunately, after a series of challenges, including Senate hearings, investigative um, uh, inquiries from Congress, from the NTSB, from so many different organizations, um, and ultimately uh, an unsuccessful, I would say, uh, set of uh, kind of defenses there, the CEO was let go. The president of the division was let go. The chief legal officer was let go. The chief communications officer was let go. We could do this all night. Um, <laughs> uh, what ended up happening at this place was it was a clean slate. And a new leadership team came in and said, what we need to do here is really lean into accountability, really lean into transparency. And we need to be human. And we need to accept the fact that mistakes were made. There were a lot of things that the company needed to learn from. And now it was time to really embrace that process of rebuilding. So to answer your quick question, a lot of things went wrong. And I think it triggered the company to think really differently and really fundamentally about what we needed to do in order to give people that confidence that this was a different company and it's one that they should trust. Well, that leads me to my second question. How did the leadership team, including you, uh, work to rebuild uh, trust after these planes were recertified by the FAA and returned to flight? Yeah, it's a good question. And I'll start off by saying that the journey to rebuilding trust here didn't begin when the planes were recertified. There's a lot of technical things that happen in the process to getting a plane back in the air after something like this happens. It was an 18, 20 month actually. Brian, who was with me at Boeing over there is gonna hold me accountable. So when I say something wrong, he just goes, so <laughs> 20 months <laughs> journey to get back to certification for the plane that was grounded after the second accident. Um, what you have to do in these circumstances is not just a communications effort. It's a real core um, and holistic look at what has happened in the company, what has happened with our operational procedures, with our engineering, uh, and what happens day to day with pressures on the shop floor that could lead to something like this happening in the first place? And how do you make the necessary changes to get to a place where something like that can never happen again? So the company needed to look at all of this. So the first thing that they really took a look at was the safety protocols and the procedures that needed to put in place and put together an actual safety committee that reported directly into the chief engineer of the company and duly to the CEO of the company to fix some of these issues. Um, realigned the engineering structures so those folks didn't report into the folks who were selling airplanes, but reported in again to the CEO and to the board. They had to think a little bit differently about everything that needed to be done on all different levels and also address the culture what has created a climate in which something like that can happen not once but twice and so when you think about that from an overall leadership perspective there's a ton of things that you have to do and if anyone ever tells you that when you have a crisis like this to go over there and make the bad story stop run away from that situation that's not the answer um, what you need to do from a communication standpoint, Nancy, is to really start to dig into what are the fundamental changes that are being made and how can we talk about them in a way that not only will, I'm sure, talk about this over the course of the programs, I'd love to um, get employees to a place where they understand what we're doing, that they're bought into the vision of this, that they are really the ambassadors of the change that's happening. But then after that, go out and help external stakeholders, in this case, regulators, customers, which in the case of Boeing are airlines, right? Um, and the flying public feel like they can have that level of confidence in those products. And, you know, that's a really, really challenging task. And a lot of people think that you go out there, you do a couple of things, this happens overnight, happens over the course of a, of a couple of months. That's not the case. This is going to be a multi-year journey for the Boeing company, of which it's only on its first leg. 
So let me ask you the next question. So they're in the rebuilding trust phase, Correct. but the question I guess becomes, how long will it take? And do you believe the brand will ever be fully recovered? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, Nancy. I think the answer is definitely yes, but it will be different. So I'm starting with your second, in case you're wondering. I'm starting with the second question. I'm going to answer the first question in a second. I'm not stalling. So when you think about the Boeing brand, it has historically been a company that has been on the leading edge of so many firsts. Um, if you think about, you know, uh, Bill Boeing and, and his relationship with the Wright brothers back in the day, the aviation kind of environment that we've gotten used to that allows us to be so connected around the globe was pioneered by this company. And so there is a deep legacy um, and history and, and pride that's associated with that. Uh, I want to stress that point because when you think about the steps that the company is one has taken and still needs to take, uh, they have to reconcile with where they've been, the challenges that so many people who have been through those doors have faced uh, in terms of their own personal identities, having worked at this company, in some cases, 30, 40, 50 years, the pride that they've got in the program, where it's been and where it's going, and then say, we need to take a step forward to the future where not only can something like that not happen, but we are still expected to be on the forward leading edge of innovation. What does space flight look like for the future? What does intercontinental travel for the future look like? All of these different things. And so I think that you'll find that as you go through these processes, you do actually get back to a place where it makes sense, but it's not where you came from, it's where you need to be now. If you back where you came from, people wouldn't trust you. They need to be able to see that you are a new company that has emerged from, from all of this. So long answer to maybe answer what I think is a short question. How long is it going to take? Hard to handicap, but I don't think it takes less than five years to get to a place where people really feel like, all right, this is a company that's learned from this and we feel good about it. But the other thing you got to keep in mind is that when you're on a journey of trust, it's not always about people saying, hey, listen, this is a company that is a fantastic um, you know, innovator, all of these things, it's going to be a net promoter of your brand. Sometimes when it comes to an uh, organization like Boeing that produces planes, people don't buy tickets for the airline from Boeing. They buy them from American Airlines, United, whichever you know, carrier suits your needs and gives you the best loyalty program. Um, when you think about it from that perspective, you need them to not think about you as Boeing. You need them to be able to get on their plane, know what their destination is, and spend their time thinking about whatever it is they need to do on the other side. If they're worried about whether they're going to make it to their destination or not safely, you've already failed. So the journey, I think, is to get to a place where people feel like they can actually do that without thinking about it. Well, you still didn't answer time, but that's okay. She noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> So my next question is, you, you mentioned one of the stakeholders is, is the employees. Yeah. And that's critical to a, a company that depends on their passion, innovation, et cetera. So how should our audiences, those in our, our audiences who are in the communications and in the, in the brand side, how should they think about the, the challenges of building trust among employees? So I will say this, your employees, are your most important stakeholder, full stop. When you think about rebuilding trust as a brand, if you haven't won over the people who are inside your company, those who understand what's truly happening on the ground day in and day out, because they're the ones who are actually responsible for carrying it out, you're not gonna be successful. You can't go to the market and say to investors, say to policymakers, say to the media that you've made changes, and have your employees think, you know what, that doesn't really represent my experience day to day. One, because they're going to say it. And, and, and I think in 2020, 2021, a lot of companies who are used to being able to say what they were saying externally and have companies kind of grumble, you know, employees kind of grumble under their breath, that was the case. They didn't agree with it. That's all over. The age of employee activism is here. If they don't agree, they're going to get out and they're going to talk about it. They'll talk to the media about it. They will talk to their friends about it. They will talk to anybody who will listen. So you need to get them on board, first of all. 
And the only way that you're going to be, this goes back to what we were saying a little while ago about the leadership changes that you need to make. The only way you're going to get to a place where people are on board is if they see the changes happening and you're talking about it constantly. If you are not reiterating these messages, helping people understand what that looks like, uh, understanding what it means to them. And when you're talking at a leadership level, that's 30,000 feet, how it connects to the jobs they have to do every day, and they don't feel that difference, uh, then you got some more work to do. Uh, I will say, because I know we talked um, about the fact that a lot of my responsibility while I was at Boeing was media relations, there are times just tactically that you're going to want to use the media to engage with your employees. There are a lot of channels, you, I guess, you know, if you've been at a big company, a lot of times you use an intranet site and you try to reach your employees through the employee news channels for the most part, not always, those channels are the good news. You know, here's the reason to love us today, right? Um what you realize, and this is kind of an industry benchmark, is that the engagement rates for employee channels, in many cases, don't break the double digits, right? So if you've got 140,000 employees in the case of Boeing, and you find out that a really good story on the employee intranet hits 4,000 of those employees, you got to find other ways to reach them. And so we would go to the Seattle Times, we would go to the Charleston Post Courier, places where our employees are actually based at and make sure that we were talking to them so they could hear these messages as well, reiterate these points. This is an interesting, and we're, we're deviating a little from the topic, but you were a founding member of the Racial Equity Task Force at Boeing. Why was this something that the company, in the midst of all it was going through, felt it had to focus on? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting, question, we faced a time of, of national reckoning around race, particularly since the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others. And obviously, we're watching on the news trials of, of you know, the persecutors of Ahmaud Arbery and so many others. This is not a different time from what we have faced over the last century and, and more in this country. However, there is an opportunity for us in this moment because of the eyeballs that have been on it, because of the conversation that's been created around it. Boeing is one of the companies that's been thinking about this for a long time, but I think that the additional momentum that was created from this national conversation that's been created was an opportunity to really double down on the commitments and think differently about how we did things. There was a handful of things that the company really looked to do. Um, one of them was really thinking about the dialogue within the company and how do you talk about these issues, which is very uncomfortable, very, very, very difficult to do. So how do you create a safe space to be able to have these types of conversations? Uh, two was where folks are not really getting with the program when it comes to a diversity standpoint, um, really punish those things. We had multiple cases uh, over the time at Boeing where somebody had to actually be let go for racially insensitive comments for a variety of different things that happened over the course of their time over the course of time there and it was important for the company to say that's not acceptable and we're going to deal with that um, and then you know the third piece of this was about metrics and transparency how do you get out there and be transparent about where you're at Boeing doesn't lead the pack when it comes to having diverse representation at all levels of the organization. Manufacturing, engineering, aerospace is not towards the top when it comes to industries that are really well represented in this space. But being able to come out and say, we've got a lot of work to do, here's where we're at and here's where we're going, is a really important first step because you can't be held accountable if people don't know where you're at and they don't know what you're trying to achieve. So that was really important as well. So one of the game changers today is environmental, social, and governance, or ESG. Um, it's where the actions of, of investors are really pushing the company to do what they say they're going to do. Um, do you see that affecting the issues that you're dealing with at Bully Pulpit? Yeah, tremendously. Well, I'll start off by saying, you know, for folks who are not familiar with Bully Pulpit, uh, it's an agency that was founded by the uh, leaders of the initial Obama campaign. Um, it's a progressive agency. So, you know, not to make this political, but the folks who choose to work with the organization 
generally have a bent towards progressive causes. So what does that mean? It means we spend a lot of time thinking about sustainability, thinking about DEI, thinking about many of the things that fall within the space of, of uh, ESG that you just labeled. And so, you know, we've worked with companies like McDonald's that are thinking about um, scaling for good. Everybody's familiar with the Ronald McDonald House, right? And the work that McDonald's as a company does with folks in that space. Um, what we have realized and what McDonald's has realized, for example, is that people don't necessarily buy the extra hamburger because of the work that they know and support that's going on in the Ronald McDonald House. So how do you get from a place of knowing the company does these things and thinking of these things, the things that that company does to thinking about this is the things that the, who the company is, right? That, is, that wasn't English, sorry, let's try that again. It's not about what you do, it's about who you are. And if you're thinking about, you know, all of the great work that these companies do in the community and sustainability and these facts, it really comes down to bringing to who you are and people making decisions based on that as part of your business strategy. And so we do that work with McDonald's, with Goldman, we think about 1 million black women initiative, which is all about, you know, creating opportunities and improving outcomes for folks who are uh, black women in that space. Um, with CH Robinson, you know, which is a, a trucking logistics company, we're thinking a lot more about purpose and vision and sustainability in the future. Everybody is thinking about this. Investors are holding us to account to think about it more. More than ever, CEOs are expected to take leadership positions on this. And people who are considering the companies they want to work with are really making decisions based on whose values align with theirs. So if you can't articulate that, then you're not going to be able to compete in the 21st century. So I'm going to have my last question. In strategic communications today, using data to understand stakeholders and the issues vital, um, along with traditional skills such as storytelling, developing message, and, and finding the right media to convey those messages, how do you see those skills? How do you use those skills, excuse me, as you counsel leaders both in the past and what you do today? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think it's so important and in many cases um, has been a challenge for the communications profession. Data is essential, not only to proving what you're doing is valuable, but also to understanding whether what you're doing actually is the right thing to do to achieve your outcome. Um, I think of it largely through the lens of audience. Who are you trying to reach? what are you trying to convince them to do ultimately? What's your goal with each audience? If you can get a good understanding of what that is, then you can figure out what are the right kind of measures to use to achieve what you're trying to. Maybe you want to raise awareness or maybe you want them to actually take a certain action. Maybe it's a buying decision. Maybe it is um, completely different from that, but it might have to do with so many different aspects, including you know talent coming on board and understanding what it is that you do that aligns with their values. I know we were talking about that a second ago, Nancy. So once you get to a place where you understand what your objectives are and who you're trying to reach, then you can look at where are they at? What kind of vehicles do they use to get their information? Um, what are the messages that actually resonate with them? And not what you think they are based on your gut and your experience, but what actually is moving the needle for them on the things that you want them to think about um, so that they can start to associate you and what you're trying to accomplish um, with what they're seeing. And so we have a tendency to think about data as the scary thing and numbers and things that don't apply. But really, at the end of the day, it really is looking at, you know, the behaviors that you're trying to influence and what are the things that work to get there. And if you're looking at the results and you're seeing that folks aren't necessarily buying what you're putting out, then make the changes and use it as an adjustment. So it's really insight. Okay. Now I'm done. It's your turn to ask questions. We have several people in the back with mics just like this and you get your chance to ask um, questions and we also have uh, people online who are going to be are going to be um, asking questions so who wants to be the right there we have our first j is that it k people online uh, work yeah people online might need you to use the mic right yeah, you're going to, you're going to. I know I'm a party pooper. Sorry, man. Hello. 
Is it on? Okay. Hey. Uh, so you mentioned that oh, when it came to like DEI, you guys fired a lot of people who weren't on board with, or like were just not doing things that did not align with what the company felt like. Uh, in terms of, because Boeing sells it to like other companies like United Airlines, SpiceJet, all that, all that, all the other companies. So how did it affect? Because I know like there's other companies that you guys sell to right. that are probably not the best because they have like culture problems. So like, hello, can you hear it? Okay. So did you guys make any efforts when it came to like selling to companies that are probably not as good with their DI efforts? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I really... Yeah, I think the way I understood it, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, or Brian will just shake his head, one of those two things. Um, <laughs> question I understood is, as we were taking a hard stance at Boeing on some of the employee behaviors that were just unacceptable, particularly where it came to DEI, how did we reconcile that with our customers and those who, in some cases, might not have had the same philosophy um, or at least discipline towards approaching DEI and some of that um, uh, outcomes. So my answer to that would be, you really take a step back and you say, what do we value? What matters to us? We fired between the time of, of George Floyd's murder in May of, of uh, 2020 and April of 2021. So about a year later, when the company put out its first uh, annual diversity and inclusion report, uh, 65 employees. Those were folks who had done a variety of different things that ranged from uh, racially insensitive comments at work to, in two different cases, one time in Philadelphia and one time in Everett, Washington, uh, employees, Black employees had come to the office to find nooses on their desks. So when you think about the environment that creates, where not only are we talking about, you know, employee like the microaggressions is a big thing to talk about and folks not feeling like they're valued comfortable not promoting all of that's really really important but we're talking about a whole nother level here also where people are are not feeling safe in their workplace and we're talking about both physical and psychological safety and that's not acceptable it's not acceptable in any world so for us to take a second and and, and think well how are our customers going to feel about this not interested what we're interested in is saying, we believe that this is something that needs to change. We're gonna change it. And if our customers have a problem with it, we can talk to you about it. And we'll tell you what we were thinking, but we're not gonna change the way we thought about these things. And so that was really important to us to be able to figure out first, what's our North Star and then pursue that relentlessly. And the hope is if you take a leadership stance that people will follow. Just, I just have a follow-up question. Uh, so. I intended the question to be so like would you still were you guys still selling to people or to companies that were not as inclusive or did not have the same stance on DEI as Boeing did yeah it's a great question and I think it's a particularly important one um, for some of the consumer companies that we face where you think about you know doing high volumes of sales to a variety of people where it comes to um uh, the industry that we were in, I think there are folks who are in a variety of different places on the spectrum in terms of that journey, but I couldn't think of an organization that we worked with that wasn't intending to get to the right outcome. So when you see folks are actually heading the right direction, you work with them. And I don't think that it was our place or is it anyone's place to judge and to condemn somebody who is just not as far along on the journey. And our goal was always to be supportive in that way. Hi there. I'm always intrigued about candidates, professional careers and development. Mm -hmm. I'm a recruiter, so there's my bias. <laughs> uh, I'd love to hear how you have grown professionally, having moved from corporate to agency, and what you see now as your core competencies now working on the agency side. Well, that's an excellent question. I, well, I feel like... <laughs> I was going to say, you do it well. Um, so, you know what, I'll say this, I'll, I'll start off now, get to the core competencies, assuming that I have any, and Brian will keep me honest. So when I think about um, kind of the agency world, and when I think about the in-house world, 
a lot of times it's never the twain shall meet, <laughs> you know? People spend a ton of time in their careers on one side or on the other, and many cases will come from agencies to in-house, but folks who have spent time on both sides and have gone back and forth are a little bit um, less common. And I found that it is tremendously helpful to spend time on both sides because you really appreciate the perspectives of both. When you're in-house, it's easy to get tunnel vision. You get really narrow, you get really deep in your field. I could tell you a lot more than literally anybody in this audience is ever going to want to know about airplanes and how they're made and wing tips and landing gear. She's interested. So you can do that, but what you're going to miss out on is the broad perspective. When you're at an agency, you spend a lot of time thinking about so many different things, so many different companies, the challenges they're facing, the opportunities that they have, and you're able to bring that in, distill the very complex and wide ranging into something that's going to be compelling and helpful um, for individuals. And so you don't necessarily go as deep, but you go much more broad. And I think for anybody who's out here who's considering careers in either do it and then try the other and see what you like see what really resonates with you but bring those insights because wherever you're at whether you're in an agency or you're in house the experiences you've had in the other are going to just make you more successful at what you're trying to accomplish is that good jane you like that okay we do have some questions online i'll come over here make sure i can read them real quick Thanks, Bradley. So what is the biggest challenge in retaining customers and acquiring customers when trust has been questioned? Yeah, um, it's, it's really hard, right? When you're thinking about uh, building new customer relationships when you haven't been able to secure their trust, uh, mainly because you think about a relationship with a customer and it is exactly that, it is a relationship. And everyone who knows, if you've had a bad relationship before, it's kind of hard to go to the next level. So when I think about the relationship that Boeing's got with many of the airlines, and we could talk about this for any company, but we happen to be talking about Boeing right now. If you want to get to a place where they trust you enough to buy your next series of airplanes, and, and for what it's worth, these are tens of millions of dollars per plane. These are not cheap. So if you're gonna go into a relationship like that, you've gotta have the foundation that's solid. So I know we talked a little bit about this, but we spent a ton of time with the airlines before we ever said anything publicly, each time we were gonna say something publicly to help them understand, here's what we've done. We wanna make sure you're bought into this. You agree with what we've done. You agree with where we're going. You agree with the statements we're gonna make about how this is gonna impact your customers. And we did things together. If we had an opportunity to go with United Airlines or American Airlines and talk to them together, to their customers, to the flying public, to all of you guys out here who have to consider whether you're gonna buy a ticket or not, we'd do that. And if we couldn't do it together, then we considered not doing it all because it's more important for us to have that trust with our customers than to try to get out of a situation um, with our, our reputation that doesn't make sense or doesn't feel authentic. We have time for one more question. Great. Um, thank you so much for your insights. Um, I found them really um, just so useful is my profession. I've been, as I'm, as I was hearing you talk, the one thing I don't think has been addressed is the impact of social media, because I can imagine in 2020 and, and the unfortunate events <laughs> that Boeing had in, in 2018, um, social media was uh, a big factor in what, in your communication strategy. So can you talk about um, how we as communicators and those of us who do work in the social space um, can be more effective or more thoughtful as we're tweeting, posting on Facebook, whatever, about our, our companies or our organizations, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, efforts. Yeah, happy to talk about that. And thanks for the question. And I will also say there are a couple of people from Bully Pulpit here who are even smarter on this than I am, which is not hard to be, um, <laughs> uh, who work on a lot of our digital strategy. So um, definitely find them after the event. But what I would say fundamentally is that the entire game has changed once this became a 24-7 uh, environment, right? When you think about social media, it has great power 
it also has great risks. So you have to be thoughtful about what you're saying, when you're saying it, how you're saying it, your word choice when saying things, particularly on very charged topics. Um, we live in a day of outrage. And so even trying to do the right thing isn't always necessarily going to get you the right outcome, but it doesn't mean you don't engage. It's easy to be too scared to get out there and do something. But I think it's so important to be able to say, what do I truly believe when it comes to, as you were talking about DEI, this really important topic of our time? And how do I say it in an authentic way that is unique to my voice and where I come from and my perspective? Don't try to do too much, right? Speak from your own you know, voice, but also don't be afraid to lean in a little bit because people engage with content that makes them think, that makes them question, that makes them probe. People are less inclined to engage the stuff that's safe and is a repetitive you know, version of everything else going on. It's a platform, it's an opportunity, it's unique to this generation and this moment that had existed for the vast majority of time where communication could be one way and people were comfortable with that. Um, it's a new day. And uh, again, ask Jane, she knows a lot more than me, but I think this is, this is a good net net way for us to be going. Well, I wanna thank you, Bradley. This has been a very uh, interesting and illuminating and frankly insightful conversation that we've had. And I wanna thank all of you guys that were the audience. Uh, great job you did. And now we're gonna do a quick change and bring up a panel of our alums to speak on uh, similar issues that we've just talked about. So hang in with us, we'll be right back. Thanks so much. All right, thanks everyone. So as Nancy mentioned, in this next portion of the program, we're gonna have a moderated panel led by a communications expert and one of my absolute favorite professors, Ernest Duplessis there on the end. Yep. And this is gonna be followed up by another Q&A session with the audience, so be ready. Um, but we're really lucky and grateful to have a group of uh, communications professionals with us here tonight, all who graduated from Medill. So starting closest to me, we have Michael McGrew. And Mike is currently an Executive Vice President, Chief of Communications, and the CSR and Diversity Officer for Constellation Brands. In this role, yeah, we can clap, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> in this role, he leads the team responsible for developing and executing the company's uh, corporate communications, investor relations, corporate social responsibility, and DE&I strategies designed to enhance the company's reputation. Mike joined Constellation Brands in 2014 as a senior director of communications for the company's beer division and has held a number of roles with increasing responsibilities over the years, including ones at Granger, Alliant Food Service, and Morton International. So thanks, Mike. And then here in the middle, we have Ruth Venning. So Ruth is currently the Executive Director of Investor Relations for Horizon Therapeutics, which is a biopharmaceutical company specializing in medicines for rare diseases. In addition to coordinating with the investment community and other IR responsibilities, she is spearheading Horizon's ESG initiative. And before joining Horizon in May of 2017, she was the Director of Investor Relations for Hospira, and previously served in investor relations roles at Telephone and Data Systems Incorporated and United Airlines. Additionally, Ruth has served on the NIRI Board of Directors since 2018, where she is currently the chair of the board. So thank you, Ruth. And lastly, in the purple, we have Portia Young. And Portia is the Director of Corporate Public Relations for Sargento Foods Incorporated, which is a family-owned $1.6 billion cheese company based in Plymouth, Wisconsin. And in this role, she has helped build the company's external presence through developing a media relations strategy, executive visibility, and uh, compelling storytelling. She's also the Emmy Award-winning host of a broadcast news magazine on Milwaukee PBS titled 1036. And prior to her roles, she was an anchor and reporter for three different ABC News affiliates with her longest tenure at WISN-TV in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So again, from all of us, thank you guys so much for being with us here tonight. And with that, let's get started. So thank you very much. So for Mike, for Ruth, and for Portia, thank you guys for joining us. I know this is a 
sacrifice of time. But I also want to thank you guys out there. What a great showing. Give yourselves a hand as we go forward. All right, I know we're having issues with the sound, but we're going to try to project and so that you can hear us uh, and that's so we can get into this. Let me just give you a short uh, kind of primer on what we're hoping in terms of our objective tonight. Uh, really don't want to hear me talking a lot, right? I want to set the scene and then I want to open it up so that we want to hear your comments and what's going on. Guys online, I'm expecting you guys to start pouring stuff in there. Give us your perspective. Give us your questions that we have as we move forward. Look, our topic tonight is trust. Uh, I will tell you that there's probably no other more salient topic that we have. My last five clients that I talked to, all of the issues were based in this notion of trust. We talked tonight about building trust. I think a lot of what we need to talk about is how to rebuild trust, right? It's impossible to strike this topic without referring to or somehow leveraging uh, the Edelman Trust Barometer research that's done. So I want to pull a couple, call a couple of uh, key learnings that was from the 2021 uh, key metrics that they put out, uh, and then I want to bounce it over to you guys so you can open up. So a couple of really big trends and things that happened uh, as reflective in that research uh, was number one, if you think about the four big institutions in our society, you've got the media, you've got the government, you've got non-governmental organizations, and you've got business. Those are the four big institutions. In 2021, the only of one of those four big institutions that scored high enough on the trust barometer to be considered trustworthy was business. Secondly, a, a key a learning that they pulled out from that is when they looked at all of those four institutions across the dynamics of ethics and competency, only business scored high on both. In other words, the public perception was that business was both not only competent at what they did, but ethical. I want you to understand, when I started in this business, this has been a major shift. I served 21 years in the military where I enjoyed every year the highest rating of trust in our society. That has eroded consistently and significantly. And so tonight what we've done is brought you to the tip of the spear to talk to the guys who are doing the best at this. And what we want to do is we want to learn from them. So guys, tonight, as we think about how we're going to jump into this pool, if you think about the challenges that you have out there in your businesses uh, and in the industries that you're in, what are the big ones that you're dealing with as it relates to the trust for your organization? And then share with us how you're handling that. So let's start down at the end of Mike, but guys, weigh in. I don't want this to be rigid in terms of, I got a question for you. We're just going to dive in and deal with it. What are you dealing with at the tip of the spear? So I'm going to put my DE and I hat on to answer this question uh, because I will tell you diversity, equity, and inclusion for us, although I would think this, I would say this is a major trend and you heard Bradley talk about it uh, earlier in the discussion. That's been a major area of, of focus for us. Uh, we started our DE and I journey. So I, I work in the beverage alcohol industry, work for Constellation Brands. Uh, we're across beer, wine, and spirits. That industry in general has not been very diverse. And therefore, when we have gone, gone to source talent over the years, the talent pool that we drew from hasn't been very diverse either. And when the George Floyd murder uh, occurred, there was all this pent up kind of energy and emotion within our business and across our stakeholder universe. Uh, we started our journey several years ago. It's the first time that we stood up an organization that had dedicated resources to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We created the role of chief diversity officer, so I'm the second to assume that role. Um, and we actually, it was, we built kind of foundation, right? We, we organized some groups. We, we set up nine business resource groups. We got people organized. We got our executive management team kind of involved and engaged in the process. And we started engaging in, in activities, which was great to an extent. It was a good start. Um, but when George Floyd happened, that incident happened, um, there was an uproar within our business because the question that I, when I took over and assumed the role, the question that I got asked was, all right, Mike, it's great. We're doing all this stuff, but are we actually moving the dial? And the reality was we were not, right? So for us, one of the biggest challenges is purely representation. That's the first kind of challenge that we're facing into. We've got to fix a representation gap. I talked about this pool of talent that we have typically sourced from, and we're very good at it. And we, we do very well as an organization too, right? When you do very well, it's hard to institute change, 
But when George Floyd happened, we had very few people in the organization that were comfortable engaging in conversations all the way up to senior leadership. We didn't know what to do. Right? Now, fortunately, we had formed some business resource groups and we actually engaged in some discussion with them. And I will tell you, it was eye-opening for a variety of different leaders in the business, right? Our senior leadership team, our executive management team got our black BRG together. It's a small population within our, within our network. Uh, and, you know, CEO opened up the discussion uh, with, with some opening remarks and then kind of opened the aperture for discussion. Nobody said anything, of course, because nobody wants to challenge the CEO. I kind of waded in and gave some personal testament to what happened because I had been in a situation where I, I called on one of our big real retail accounts. I had experienced what it was like to be profiled, right? I went into one of our big liquor purveyors retail establishment and I was followed around the store. Now, <laughs> the store manager didn't understand who I worked for. We're one of their biggest suppliers, where I went to school, where I worked, what my responsibilities were, what I, you know, where I lived, what I drove up in. They just saw me walk in with shorts, a t-shirt and made an assumption. And if there's ever a profile of somebody that was not gonna rip them off, it was me, <laughs> honestly, right? But it was a testament. And it was, when I told that story, it was eye-opening to folks in, in the room and, and many execs that I'm very close with, it became real to them. And it opened the floodgates. We had some people that took some risks and had some courageous conversations and actually lashed out at leadership a little bit because they were frustrated at the continued lack of diversity within our company and the fact that we didn't react quick enough. We didn't check in with them right after this happened. It took us a while to make decisions about how we would respond. And it was raw and emotional, but it was awesome because it allowed us an opportunity to see a window into some things that, were, that we need to fix as an organization. Our CEO did a great job of leaning into that conversation. That was a term that was used earlier, uh, making them feel comfortable and appreciated for sharing that perspective. And then we actually engaged them in the process to try and not solve for, but address the issue in an applicable way, right? And so that set forth uh, a plan that was developed in this group of individuals, employees in the business that would have never had this form before, actually had an opportunity to present their recommendation to our executive management uh, committee. And it was all about how do we close this? How do we enhance social equity? Leverage our platform to enhance social equity within our communities, within our industry, and then really focus within our four walls. And so we've stood up and it's had a big influence on our diversity, equity, and inclusion um, strategy, to be quite honest. So representation, we've got a big effort on fixing that. We've got to think differently, act differently, lean into the process, and leaders need to own it and drive it and hold themselves and each other accountable. Uh, the second is you can't just bring diversity into an organization that is not diverse and expect it to work. You got to think and act differently. How do you put your arms around that diverse talent and make it feel welcome? Make it feel like this is the place for them, like they're valued, they're appreciated, like you get them, right? So, and we've got work to do in this regard. It's not that people are doing it maliciously. They just don't know. They don't know how to think about it. They even, so there's a big effort around like awareness and education and, and opening people's eyes to the realities of, of some of the things that are happening out there that are kind of the underbelly of, 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 of our society, but we have an opportunity to do better. So we're engaging in that process. And then the third is focusing outside of our four walls to do all that we can uh, within our industry, within our communities. And we're doing a variety of different things. We can get into that later, but um, for us, that is, that is the challenge. And I would reference it as an opportunity. And for us, I talk about this with my team. There has no time, there has been no time when communication, CSR, IR, ESG has been more at the forefront of our company, like driving our company, a core pillar of our company strategy than it is today. And I, I, I think that is fully responsible for us now having that proverbial seat at the table. This function has been elevated to the executive management committee level. And so I see it as opportunity. Mike, thank you so much for that. I mean, think when you read through the 2021 uh, research material, one of the things or the nuances that is pointing out is that as important as DEI is, because there are so many issues, it's actually maybe not getting the play at your company at other companies. And so now there's wrestling with how do we give it the priority? Okay, so that's good perspective. Ruth, from your perspective, what do you say? So I'm, I'm here from a lens of investor relations. So I work for a pharmaceutical company. Our products affect people's lives. So we've worked since the very beginning to, to uh, 
protect us for the life and the quality of the medicines we make. Part of the reason we, we're not worried about, or we're not having to deal with uh, regaining trust at this point, we want to maintain it. Because we have, a, we have a very high trust factor among our patients. And at this point, because we've been ex executing so well, our investors like us very, a lot as well. Uh, but so one of the things I think that is so important from our perspective is something Bradley mentioned, and that's ethics. Ethics is really at the heart of everything we do. In addition to which, in our company, all of us say it's personal for us. What we do is personal, and we want to make a difference. I think maybe 20 years ago, that might not have been met with much credibility, but it's met with a lot of credibility today because they see it. Our, our patients see it. The physicians we work with, they see us leaning in, and there's that word, to help make a difference in their lives. From the investor's perspective, it's, uh, it's a question of building. Oh, well, that would be, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I don't project as well as you. Thank you, thank you, Charles. So from an investor perspective, uh, what we're trying to do is communicate the story to Wall Street. Our story is complicated and a lot of investors don't understand the science. I think one of the reasons we've been able to build the trust is we're effective at communicating. Well, I have to plug that because I went to Medill and, uh, and I, I know a lot of people who, who didn't go to Medill who think they're very good at communications. It's not always the case as we all know. You know, <laughs> clear, compelling, it sounds familiar, doesn't it, Nancy? Nancy was my instructor when I first came to Medill. And we, we are clear in our communications. We, we say, this is what we plan to do, and we've executed on it, and so we've built a lot of trust. So I think it, it, it boils down to what you're hearing. You're hearing a lot of the same messaging. Again, there's the consistency, the importance of living what you say you're gonna do. It's very easy to say, something, it's very difficult to act on it. Simple, but not easy. So it's probably not as, um, uh, from the investor perspective, they are looking for you to execute on and deliver on your promises, and we do that to the investors. We also do it every day to our patients. The other thing I would say is our employees love working at our company. I've never worked at a company where people like the company so much. And I think it's because they see our senior management acting on what they tell us to do. They walk the talk. Again, I think that is just so important. It's, I've, I've worked in a lot of places. I've done a lot of different things. And most of the companies are really good. But this is a company where our CEO is a patient. He, he has a rare disease. He knows what it's like. He also knows what it's like to work in a very high-paced, pressured environment. And he models that for us. And I have to tell you, he's, I really respect this guy, as do most of the stakeholders. I mean, he meets with patients. He meets with physicians. He meets with investors. And they relate to him. Engagement is just so important as well. So thank you for that, Ruth. Maintaining the trust, which is a different dynamic uh, that we need to also include in our discussion. And Portia, what about with you? So what's the biggest challenge we've dealt with yeah, what, the past what you year? You know, you're, you're what, what could that be? <laughs> We're all wearing masks, <laughs> COVID. So we are Sargento Foods and we are a $1.6 billion cheese company in Plymouth, Wisconsin. I pass by cows every day <laughs> on my way up. We're a family owned company. So we're three generations in. So our CEO is the grand, grandson of our founder. How do you maintain trust with what Bradley said? Where's Bradley? Oh, there he is. With your biggest and most important stakeholder, your employees. So COVID has just kind of put us through a loop, but we had actually one of our best years we've ever had last year. And this year, we're going to surpass that. And that is because we have about 1,500 people who work in our manufacturing. So they package our cheese. We have about 500 or so office employees. There's some of that divide. But what one thing that we pride ourselves on is keeping effective communication, keeping open lines of communication. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, March 2020, we 
pulled together a public health task force and we were tasked with, I was sat on it, we were tasked with researching everything that we could, finding out, benchmarking, seeing what other companies were doing, how to care for employees, how to communicate to employees. These were different times. I mean, nobody knew what was gonna happen next. Now that we're about year in, the public health task force, we don't meet as regularly, but we're still forming because we are still reacting to a lot of the things and we're having to put in policies and procedures to keep people as safe as possible. Um, I'm proud to say that we managed to do that. And I'm just so proud of what people are saying. We had people, employees coming up to us saying, thank you. I didn't know this. We did a whole fireside chat virtually with experts from hospitals to try to increase the vaccination rates. So we really gave them the information that they needed. And we really started inward first. So we were kind of leading the way in our community. Excellent point. So look, uh, as we go to the tip of the spear, there's a lot of issues that are out there and they continue to emerge at an accelerating rate. Now, the, the other thing that is a major trend that's going on right now is that there is now an expectation that the CEO, the leader of an organization of a company is going to have a public position or stance on all these issues. I get called from a, a professional in the industry a couple of weeks ago and they go, Ernest, there's this emerging issue you know, should we talk about it or not? How do you determine where you're going to weigh in and where you're going to remain silent? Guys, I know that you're facing this, right? You, you pointed out uh, the big things that are going on, but, but what kind of framework or thinking goes into your leaders deciding where they're going to play and where they're not going to play, mm -hmm. right? And, and once again, everybody doesn't have to answer, but if you got some insight on that, I also want to hear from the guys that are online. I know we got a lot of experience online and then we're gonna start bringing in you guys here from the audience, so mm -hmm. get ready. A lot of issues out there. How do you determine where your company's gonna stand and if they're gonna take a position? Yes. You want us? So we're family owned, did I say that? <laughs> we're in Sheboygan County, Wisconsin. Pretty homogenous, pretty aging, pretty conservative. We are not provocators at Sargento, we are not but what we are is true and humble. And we have core values like ethics and trust and accountability that are tried and true no matter what. So our CEO, he feels comfortable in that space. He feels comfortable in giving back and making sure that everybody wins. So he says, you know, I'm going to be who I am. I'm gonna be the best me, kind of what Mike was saying but I'm not gonna be out there and doing all the things because then that's not true to who he is. And people in Sheboygan County are gonna see him at the store and say, that's not who I grew up with. So I think we have a, we, we really have to find that sweet spot and we are finding it, but we definitely know we need to stay true to who we are, speak with an authentic voice to our values and not try to be pulled in different directions because I think that would also cause a risk for your reputation as well. No so. doubt about it. Mike, I know you want to weigh in on it. Yeah, so authenticity and adherence to your values, exactly the way that we think about it. You know, we have a lot of internal debate and everybody's looking for this to be a black and white issue. All right, what are the issues that we're going to wade in on and not wade in on? Well, you can have an idea of the stuff that makes sense that is more core to who you are and what you, what you do as a company, but you still have to decision on each one of those, because there are so many different nuances that you have to account for, right? All your different stakeholders. You don't want to say something in one venue that is going to break you into jail with others unless you're willing to assume that risk. And any time that you go out and speak on an issue, take a stance on an issue, you are assuming some risk. There is more and more pressure being applied to CEOs and companies. Back in the day, it was, hey, I'm going to fade back in the bushes, let this play out and then reemerge when it's when it's post is clear and then go about my daily business. People or companies and CEOs are being called out now. And I think social media has a big role to play in this too. Called out now when they're not taking a stand on issues. But for us, we're not going to wade into every issue. We've got to make sure that it makes sense for us. Uh, we do a stakeholder kind of assessment. This is the beauty, by the way, of having diversity, an influx of diversity in your organization, because then you've got diverse perspectives that can bring different viewpoints to the table from there, each of that we call them like street corners, right? Their view from their street corner 
And each one of them helps you make a more well-rounded, well-thought-out decision. And then it comes down to, are we willing to assume this risk or not? Does this adhere to our values or not? Is this time to take a stance or not? Do we want to be first or not? But it's not black. Owned. These things are hard, right? And so for us, it's, but I love it, right? Because this is, this is what we get paid to do. Uh, and this is when communications really kind of takes the forefront and, and is it in the spotlight. So you want your chance in the hot box, like, this is it. This is the opportunity, but it's hard, right? And you want to make sure that you're not making decisions in a vacuum or being narrow-minded in the decisions that you make. Um, you want to do you. You want to make decisions that are in the best interest of your stakeholder universe, that don't get you into trouble with your investors, uh, that don't get you in trouble with employees, both current and prospective, because they're all watching to see how you uh, how how you address this stuff. And your business partner, not only consumers for us, uh, but it's our distributors and our retail partners as well. Because what we're finding is that when an issue happens, and we've actually had this right, when an issue happens to a company that you're associated with, now the media is coming to us. Right. We just had this happen. And, you know, I was talking to my team and uh, we were, you know, the original recommendation was to try and downplay it and move past it. I'm not going to talk about the specific issue because it will reveal who this partner is. But I started asking questions like, how do you know? Do you understand how they've responded? How do you know that we're comfortable continuing to be associated with this organization? Because if I'm a good investigative reporter, I'm sniffing, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing blood and I'm gonna come after you with a whole litany of questions and we're not answering them, right? So we've got to make sure that we are comfortable being associated with this organization, mm -hmm. that they uh, align with our value system. And if not, everybody can understand that companies or organizations screw up, right? But if you're not sincere about fixing the issue and addressing it, uh, then perhaps we shouldn't. Because I think at the end of the day, that could cause us more problems than not. Uh, we're in a new day here. Um, it's a fascinating new day. And I actually think it's a good thing that the public is putting more pressure on companies to fix some of the issues in society to an extent. It gives me a lot of heartburn as well. But if anything is ever to get fixed, I think we have a big role to play. And, you know, the business roundtable a few years ago kind of uh, it came out in, in a decision that they made. Right. Because they used to define the mission of businesses or corporations as solely serving shareholders' needs. Don't get me wrong, that is a very, very important audience, but they came out, redefined it. It's about doing good for society and good business, right? They redefined the purpose of an organization, and that's something that we take very, very seriously. It creates an opportunity too. If you do this well, if you do this well, it actually creates another opportunity for either employees or consumers to choose you over somebody else, yeah. to stick with you and stay loyal to you, potentially to pay more for you, because what we're seeing is that consumers are demanding more of the companies and brands that they support, and they're willing to pay a little more for companies that adhere to their value system and support causes that are important to them. And so we see it as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. But if you're not careful, you get into the pander marketing, the pandering and marketing and, you know, trying to put out statements and doing things that just aren't true to who you are. Pepsi stepped in it a few years ago with the whole Black Lives Matter commercial. Everybody knows it. So we are very careful with that. We're always going to be true to what we believe and what our employees would also say. Yep, I saw that. And that is true. And I support now you guys taking that stance. All right, excellent. Quick show of hands. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll get to the, I'm opening up the questions after this last uh, segue here. Quick show of hands. How many of you guys know what ESG is? ESG, quick show of hands. I'm going to do an informal, looks like a little bit higher, a little bit higher, very quickly. All right. Looks like about 60%, uh, my undergrad's math, so I can uh, claim that we got that right. About 60% uh, know what ESG is. Ruth, this is in your wheelhouse, right? Tell us a little bit about what it is. We may know what those three words are, but, but why is this trend not only important, but why is it not going away? Sure. Is my mic on? Yep. Can you hear me? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, when you ask someone if they know what ESG is, we all know what ESG is to us. Environmental, social, and governance. It has different meanings to different audiences. This is what's so fascinating to me. And I, I, I'm going to touch on what you said, Mike, because this, this is a seminal issue. ESG has been around for about, mm, I would say, I started hearing the term in 
probably around 2005, a long time ago. But it was more about doing good and saving the environment. It's, it's, it's morphed. And it still means different things to different people. In my, in my organization, there are people who think it means doing good. I'm looking at it from an investor point of view, and I personally think one of the reasons that there's more trust in business today is because of ESG, because the investment community is focused so much on it, and that's because of something Mike mentioned, Larry Fink and Blackstone, they have decided that this is really important and that this is about stakeholder capitalism, that when you make a difference in the environment, or when you make a difference in the governance of a company or the social issues of a company, you get better returns. Yes, it is a financially based idea, but it is making a difference. And one of the reasons I think there's a lot of trust coming out of it is because investors want metrics. They want numbers. And so often we, uh, in companies, we get accused of, of being too, the word we use in the investment community is fluffy. <laughs> Meaning you, you, you say something without the backing. When you're looking at investor relations, excuse me, ESG from an investor relations perspective, you have to back it up. Now in my company, we're still, we're, it's a journey. This is one of the things you hear about ESG often. It's a journey. And one of our challenges was how do we do this when we we are, it's a new thing for us. We are a relatively small company that grew quickly. And it was hard to put metrics out when you're growing this big, you're going global, you get hit with COVID and you're moving, by the way, you're moving from a small location in Lake Forest and a, and a rented office in Dublin to huge buildings in both cities. What did we do? We engaged with all of our stakeholders again. I think Mike and I and Portia, we all think a lot alike in some respects here. And we said, look, this is where we are. This is what we're thinking of. What do you think? And if you are ready for this, Institutional Investor Magazine, do, ha, how many of you have heard of this magazine? Maybe not many of you. In the, in the investor community, it's the most important metric. It's how uh, financial, in, uh, the institutional investors and the uh, equity analysts who work with them are judged. And it's very important. Well, this week it was announced that we're number three of biotech and pharmaceutical companies in our ESG reporting. So it's because we, thank you, we are working together with our stakeholders and not just the investors, we're asking our employees. Their opinion matters a great deal. I should say our opinion matters. I'm one of them. And I wanted to mention this because I, uh, I have to eat. Uh, I have to be a little humble here. Uh, I have been honored to be able to teach Invest Relations with Nancy and Ernest. And I remember one class, um, it was actually, it was a undergraduate uh, strategic communications class. And someone said she wouldn't work for a company that didn't align with her values. And her values were ESG type values. I remember thinking, she'll learn. <laughs> well, she didn't learn, I did. And, and now what I see is the, the employees coming into our company are dictating, we want to protect the environment. We want social equity. We want you to be doing things the way we think you should do them. Doesn't mean we can do it. Again, you, you see it, there's not always an easy answer, but it's changing the equation and it is driving a lot of the change. I think, that, I think that's part of it. That for those of you who are entering the workforce, you go and, and you continue. It's your mandate because that's how things are going to change. All right, guys, thank you. All right. Give my hand, please. Okay, let's hear from you. What questions do you have? Yes, right here, please. And bring a mic over to it. 
All right, if we can, if you raise up your hand, you have a question after that, we can get the mic to you so we can move this along worship. Hello, hello. Hi, thank you for being here. It's been incredibly helpful to hear from all of you. Um, Mike, you mentioned, you know, not making decisions in a vacuum. There's not a playbook. It's not black and white. Two specific in recent instances come to mind for me. Um, number one, Aaron Rodgers and State Farm came out that he was unvaccinated and State Farm pretty readily said, hey, we're going to stand by him. It's his decision. I'm curious um, to know what, how do you make a decision like that? It, you know, we've mentioned data and statistics. Maybe it's really listening to the majority. We mentioned employees. What are they going to think? What are they going to believe? We've mentioned um, just media in general. So I'm just curious, how do you really make a decision like that where it's both sides are passionate, it's sensitive, and it's emotional? I just laughed because we're the <laughs> official cheese of the Green Bay oh. Packers. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll let you go, Mike, though. Uh, so it's, it's difficult for, for us. Our philosophy is what I would say is you've got to know your customer. And by customer, I'm going to say you got to know intimately your stakeholder universe. I go back to Nike uh, when Colin Kaepernick got all that backlash for taking a knee. Mm -hmm. And you saw all this stuff on social media about people burning Nikes. I'm never going to buy again, blah, blah, blah. Nike knew exactly what they were doing and exactly who their consumer base was, right? Athletes. Athletes tend to be in a locker room with a ton of diversity where that stuff, they're more supportive of a Colin Kaepernick than others in society. And so like they knew, ex and that's their core consumer, right? So I think they were very smart and calculated in what, the, it doesn't mean in, they knew exactly who their core consumer was or customer, what they would think, how would they, and they took a calculated risk to make a statement and it actually benefited them, right? Because mm -hmm. they were able to, actually able to tap into the emotions of the people that best support them. Uh, and, and they actually fared very, very well. For us, it's the same sort of principle. It's, and, and there's a variety of different states. So for us, first and foremost, we, we, we uh, pride ourselves on being a consumer obsessed organization. So that's the first place that we go is, we take a look at our universe of consumers. How do they view this issue, right? How would they view any particular response one way or the other? That's the first place. Second is the investment community. What kind of impact would this have? And, and again, none of these singularly will make the decision for us. It's all in. Employees, right? Diverse set of employees all around the world. How are they going to view us for this matter? Will it cause them to be proud of us? stay loyal to us? Will it strengthen our bond with them? Or will it fracture that relationship? And then our business partners as well. So we very carefully assess each of those. And then quite honestly, because again, it's not black and white, there's areas, there's shades of gray, then we've got to make a judgment call, right? Is it relevant to our business? Is it relevant to our stakeholders? Um, you know, are we willing to assume the risk associated with doing this? And then, and then we put ourselves up. I, I'm very fortunate, by the way, in that I work uh, directly with and for a CEO uh, who is a, a champion for, for a lot of these, like DE&I and ESG, like it's not hard to convince him to take a stand. And in fact, sometimes I've got to walk him back to say, hey, I don't recommend that. I, quite honestly, I don't recommend this. And here's all the reasons why. And when we start breaking it down and again, to get out of the, the emotional piece is very, very important too. You cannot, you've got to be able to remove yourself from the situation and think objectively and in a fairly fact-based manner in order to make the best the, the decisions that best serve your organization, your team, and the future. Because at the end of the day, we're all stewards of this company, which, which means we, we not only want to sustain the success that we've had, but we want to make it great for the next generation. So we want to build something that is sustainable and great over the long term. And so, you know, and, and we have a fiduciary responsibility to the company, to our employees and families that we support and our, and our shareholders. So it's, it's, it's a, that's for, and for us, that means sometimes you go a little slower. So we, we've got to have an appropriate balance of what I would say, patience and a sense of urgency, an appropriate balance of that to make sure that we're getting to what we feel is the best solution for us. And it's different for, mm -hmm. for a variety of different companies, right? Yeah, I looked at what State Farm did and I was thinking they're probably, to me, my perspective, it seemed like it was a play to their employees. Because I, 
I'd put money if they have a vaccine mandate policy, all that. It feels like they were making that play for their employees. So that's why they stuck by them. I do some internal comms as well. So it's interesting to look at it through that lens. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. All right, who's next? Back here, back in the room. We got a hand over here. All right, oh. let me, if we got a second, Mike, if we can get it to the gentleman in the blue jacket. Yes, sir. Hi, I think uh, any three of you all be uh, perfect to answer this question that I have on my mind. How do you balance being authentic to your customer base while also being appealing to potentially new customers while not shutting off the old but still being welcoming to the new? <laughs> yes, um, so how do you stay loyal to your customer base in this new age, but not cutting off potentially new customers too? Because as you all said, it's not the same as it used to be 20, 30 years ago, and you definitely have to stay up to date with everything. Okay. You want to start? Okay. That's not exactly applicable to my company right. because our customers are patients. Yes. So I think I'm going to let the consumer. Yeah, <laughs> the consumer. But, so we, we, can, we constantly listen to our consumers. We call them consumers. Uh, customers for us are our business retailers, but our consumers, we have lots of consumer insights teams. We do lots of studying. We, we, we are pushing ourselves to be in more diverse markets though, because we definitely know cheese is universally loved, but we have to broaden our horizons. So we definitely are looking into what are those things that meet their needs. So we always are looking at how families are using cheese, how they bring, how meals are being prepared with cheese. And so that that innovation in and of itself will push you into new directions. But we are main, mindful that we don't just look, you know, with blinders on that we are focused on different um, demographics and how they use cheese. So that's that's what it means to us. And we innovate on that insight. All right, Mike, before you jump in, let me just have a clarification, because I feel like there's a nuance in your question about how organizations forge new frontiers without alienating the guys they oh, okay. already have, right? So how far is our organization gonna go um, to get that next level of customer and or stakeholder without crossing that cultural line that will then alienate this group? How do you Got guys it. manage that balance? Yeah, and what I would say is, look, you, you can't be everything to everybody, right? Right, And you gotta be very comfortable with that. And that's, I, I agree with Portia. We have an extensive uh, initiative around consumer insights and analytics. We have a deep understanding of who our core consumers are, their motivations for choosing us, sticking with us, and who the profile of those future consumers are as well. We're trying to broaden the pot a little bit with a variety of, of, of our brands, but there's a core essence to who we are and why people choose us. And so we tend to fish in ponds that are around kind of that, that, core, that core essence. They have a that core set of motivations for choosing us. There are a lot of audiences out there that will make a lot of noise. This, is, this goes back to that Nike example. That doesn't mean they're, they're not all created equal. That doesn't mean they get equal weighting in our, in our decision-making process. And so you've got to get, have a deep understanding of, again, who you are, what you stand for, the consumers that your story or your brands resonate uh, with and others like them. And it's interesting for us as it relates to, you know, a lot of the things that we're facing into related uh, to a, from a DE&I -E -E standpoint. Um, you know, as we have kind of launched this journey internally for us, what we're trying to convince the organization of, because this is a massive, massive change management exercise to be quite honest, with, wrought with a lot of emotion behind it, mm -hmm. deep-seated emotion, right? And so in order to get people unified around a common sense of mission and purpose, we're rallying them around our universe of consumers. And what we're saying is that if you take a look at society in the US, because that's primarily where we sell our products, society looks a certain way today. So our consumer demographic looks a certain way today, right? Um, but as you guys have seen from the recent census data that just came out, there's this continuing trend of society in this country and around the world getting much more diverse. And particularly, as we look to the future, as, as stewards of this business, the demographic that is 16 years and younger is majority minority, vastly different. That, that diversity is accelerating, right? And so we, we have this phrase called, you know, we, we want to skate to where the puck is going to be. We do a lot of research into that upcoming generation, what their motivations are, how they think, because it's different from our core consumer today. 
and we are making decisions that help us skate to where the puck is going to be, maintaining uh, that, that connectivity or alignment to our core values mm -hmm. and the essence of our brands. And we don't get distracted by the rest. You can't right. be everything to everybody. Right. Does that help? I want to check time. How are we on time? What are we? Okay, all right. Uh, gentleman over here has the mic. Go ahead and uh, ask your question. Hello, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, my question, uh, so more often than not, social change is perceived as political. Uh, instead of a human to human interaction. Uh, and over the years, there's been an uproar of board diversity policies. How do your companies, uh, yeah, play a role in doing that? And uh, also, I mean, the change cannot happen externally if, if it does not happen internally. So yeah, just how do your companies play a role in doing so in policies such as this? Can I go first? Yeah, there we go. So I think it's really important that your your comment about it starts internally, and we really see that. Now, again, I, I'm not in HR, but I'm, I'm speaking from the employee perspective now. And um, I lived, my first uh, eight years of my career, I lived in Japan. And I, I taught cross-cultural communication. One of the things, it was a tremendous, I think the person who learned the most was me. I learned how easy it is to have bias not just easy, it's, it's part of who we are. And so one of the things that happened last year in my company was we made a real concerted, eff, concerted effort to have conversations with people who had different backgrounds and not necessarily only people of diverse races or ethnicities. It was fascinating to all of us to hear, wow, she went through that. Wow, he went through that. That's how they experienced life. And it, it, it really opens your eyes. And you know, you said it's very emotional and it's difficult, Mike. It is. But sometimes if you can go in a little more gently, it, 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 it's easier for it to happen naturally. I'm not saying it's going to be an easy process. But for example, uh, we were interviewing this week and we got training on unconscious bias. I, I watched this thing. Now, I was a trainer. I thought I knew it all. And all of a sudden it said, are you really comfortable with the candidate? Why? What's driving that? Is the candidate similar to you? Did the candidate go to the same school? Ooh. And I, that to me, that's brilliant because everyone's doing it. And every time they interview someone, they go through the training again and they, they hear new things. That's what I think is going to drive the change. It, it is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of people feel threatened. I'm not, I'm not discriminatory. I don't discriminate. Yes, we all do. We all do. And it's just a matter of learning what that is because we, we don't see it. It's like the air we breathe. Mm -hmm. And I'm always wary of the people who say, I don't see race. So I think that's kind of where a lot of our leaders were. Honestly, I don't see race because they're more of the golden rule. Treat those how you want to be treated. And when you have to hold up the mirror and I, applaud them for now taking this journey. We are on our DNI journey, DEI journey at Sargento, and I'm very proud that we are now um, naming it, claiming it, putting resource behind it. We have a leader now on that. But I was hired eight years ago. Now I'm not necessarily the profile of Sheboygan County, Wisconsin, <laughs> but I was hired with that still that vision in mind. And I joke and say I love Wisconsin, but I, I don't match the company. There's like five of us, but that's okay. I've always felt welcomed. I've always felt like I belong. And that is because our culture is one that ladders up to family. Treat others like how you wanna be treated, mutual respect. We have 20 principles that we call our corporate culture. And they have all of these different things, innovation, community outreach. I've always felt welcomed, included, made part of decision-making at the company. So. I think that everybody, like you said, it's a very, it's a process, it's a journey. George Floyd and all the things that happened last year really kind of opened eyes and says, okay, I guess I do see race. I guess I do see it. Even though you say, well, you grew up thinking, oh no, everybody's the same because that's how, you know, you're raised on a higher power. So I'm just very proud of our company that we are moving in that direction. A very, again, three generations family owned very conservative, so, but just, just happy that that's happening because we know on our heart of hearts that that's the right thing to do. All right, 
Very yeah, let me just chime in. I, I think that's a great question, by the way. Thank you for asking it. Um, I, I'm going to bring, in addition to what was said, uh, I'm going to bring another dimension in because, you know, as we have been embarking upon our DE&I journey, we started to get some feedback, particularly from older white men in the organization that, you know, when we wade into some of these tough conversations, feel attacked. And so there's a portion of me that was like, really? Um, but that's real. And the thing is, these are the majority of the people that we need leaning into this process if anything is ever to change. And so what we talk about is we got to do this in a way where we all come together. And Ruth talked about your, your experience overseas. We talk about, we, we had a, the good fortune of, we got a relationship with the Equal Justice Initiative down in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, and Brian Stevenson, who's the executive director. If you haven't heard of that organization, please look it up. Fantastic organization. They do a lot around education and awareness building about, about uh, the history of race relations uh, in, this, in this country, black history. Uh, but they also do a lot around criminal justice reform. And Brian is, is one of the most impressive individuals I've ever had an opportunity to interact with. He actually, we had him come in and talk to our board. Uh, our executive management committee is actually planning a trip down to Montgomery. Uh, in, the, in the new year uh, to visit uh, the memoriam, the Peace Memorial, all that sort of stuff. But he talked about this concept of proximity, right? And he told a very powerful story. It's too long for me to get into here. It's in his book, by the way, Just Mercy, which was uh, yeah. uh, a movie, uh, made into a movie. Uh, but he, this concept of proximity, which essentially means we all have different experiences in life. We all come at an issue from a different street corner. But if I don't take the time to understand like your reality and your experience and why you think this way or interpret it as, as, as such, we can never reach common ground. And that's what you're talking about is a lot of times these politically charged or emotionally charged issues come up and people just, they don't listen. They retreat back to their corners. They formulate their response and it's, yeah, but I'm going to, right? And it's contentious. And it doesn't need to be, because at the end of the day, we've actually got more in common than we have that divides us. If we took the time to actually get to know each other, our history, our experience, our understanding of an issue, we might be able to have more civil conversation. I might not agree with you, right? I've got friends that are of a totally different political uh, persuasion than me, but I'll sit and listen to them and ask why. And we may disagree at the end of the day, but that, that then makes them more open to listen to what I have to say. And maybe at some point that means maybe we inch closer to a middle ground. Mm -hmm. And that is, that, is how you're, that is how you're gonna get to change. If we cannot do that, I'm telling you, we will just become more polarized as a society and it will get ugly, much uglier than it is today, right? And so that's our stances and so, right? We need more diverse representation, but when we, when we bring it in house, we gotta increase that proximity. To, cre to create a truly inclusive workforce that allows me to be a better ally, right? Because if I better understand, if I'm personally and emotionally connected to you, right? You come in as a new employee, the only female in one of our meeting rooms, my antennas might be out, right? I might notice that. I might walk you around and introduce you to folks ahead of time so that you're comfortable, right? I might give you a platform to actually have your voice be heard in the meeting. And if you get run over by somebody that, you know, doesn't want to listen to what, I'm going to stop and leverage my platform to make sure that you feel comfortable, you have an opportunity to make a valued contribution. That, that's, that's how we build a truly inclusive, inclusive culture and allow that diversity to actually thrive, right? There's a study out there from McKinsey. It's a multi-year study that shows a strengthening correlation between companies, large companies around the world that have an outsized level of diversity and their ability to drive outsized performance on the top and bottom lines. This, this is not only the right thing to do, this is good business, right? But it's hard, it's emotional. Um, we're gonna have to work at it, right? It's not gonna be fixed over. We got ourselves into this situation over hundreds of years. It's not gonna be fixed next week, next month, next year, but we gotta work it each and every day, brick by brick and we can get to a better place. So hopefully that, that great, thank you. That was a great question. Guys, I apologize, but we've run out of time. Come on, please give our panel a...
Tim, do you have any last comments for us? Or I'm sorry, VJ, please. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time to come here this Thursday evening. Really grateful. This is a wonderful turnout. So first, a huge applause for all of you here. Thank you so much. There's so many pearls of wisdom in this 90 minutes. I wish we could just carry on, but this is one of the best sessions I've ever attended. The customers and consumers have plenty of options to choose from, and so trust is really important. And the principles of IMC, I think, have never been more relevant. Understanding your audiences, listening to data, collaborating with your stakeholders to really drive trust, because profit, purpose, and people all come together. I really want to thank Bradley. Where's Brad? Thank you so much. Mike, Ruth, and Portia, wonderful alums of our program and of Middle. Thank you so much. And finally, I just want to thank a few of our key people. First, Dean Charles Whitaker and the entire Dean's office. I can't thank you enough on behalf of the IMC department. Thank you. AC Simpson and Sarah Brazil, where are you folks? I really, there they are. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really want to thank the entire middle community and all of our, all, all of the community joining us online. Thank you so much. In particular, I want to thank a few IMC students, Tim, Leila, Yiru, Julio, Brianna, and Jessica. I'm truly grateful to all of you. And last but not the least, a huge thank you to my colleagues, Professor Daniel Robinson Bell and Nancy Hobar, for taking on this huge responsibility and putting together a wonderful event for all of us. So have a great evening, enjoy the long weekend and have a great Thanksgiving. Uh, we'll now make our way to the reception on the other end of this floor. Yes, thank you.